Welcome to Transformation Talks. I'm Tyro Hassan, the director of Brightline Initiative. And as you know, Brightline is a project management institute initiative dedicated to helping organizations bridge the gap between strategy design and strategy delivery. You have a dream, you have a strategy, how do you make, re make it real? Today, we are really privileged to welcome uh, Raul Avasti. Uh, and uh, Raul is the transformation lead at uh, Abbott's Laboratory, a 1,450 company serving in 160 countries with more than 107,000 employees. As you know, the theme today is digital transformations for teams that are not digital first yet. So through this, this talk, will, uh, Raul will help us better understand what, how leaders can reimagine the opportunity digitization offers to develop support function teams. We can think about operations, HR, admin, accounting, and you name them, into digital enablers. And the format today is more like a conversation. So it's, there is no PowerPoint. Uh, it's a conversation here. And also, uh, I'll be asking the, the, uh, the participants to ask questions, uh, and then we'll be going on through and then take them as we move on. So without further ado, uh, Raul, again, welcome. And, and, and you know, I, as I was thinking about today, I was say, OK, as opposed to me going and reading a long resume, I said, let us ask Raul to tell us more about yourself and uh, what drives you and what has shaped your career toward transformation. Thank you. Thank you, Dairu. Thank you for the opportunity. I am really honored and excited to be here. You know, I, I, I deeply admire this audience and I have a deep respect uh, for all the Brightline initiatives. I, I personally have learned a lot uh, by being in the touch points in the different Brightline initiatives and different YouTube videos that you all do. So thank you for that. And thank you for asking me that question, Dairu. You know, I think I'm fortunate that my professional journey coincided with the digital age, right? And it gave me the opportunity to experience many things firsthand. I remember my first digital exposure was somewhere in my college. And um, in my college, I was studying my computer science honors. Uh, I, I made my own website, it was a lot about cybersecurity. And there we were handling a lot of uh, people and it was a website turned into a blog. But that was a very early step. I was just trying to understand what this is. But I still remember when I was in my college, part-time I used to sell SIM cards and landline phones. It was a 2G era at that time, right? And uh, one day, online recharge came into the market. And the way I used to sell those, you know, uh, cardless landlines and those, you know, the SIM cards, that sales doubled, tripled. And that was the first time I realized that how a digital initiative can make such a big impact to the end people life, right? Me as somebody on the selling side of it, how I could see my revenues grow, my sales grows around that. And that is where I really understood that the digital, if it can solve problems, it can create that huge wider impact. From that, I actually uh, worked a lot on the cybersecurity side of it. In fact, I did work with a, uh, with a state police force on various matters of cybercrime, uh, of national repute. And then I eventually did my MBA. Uh, I did my MBA in marketing. And that was the time after that I got my first early exposure to the enterprise digital world with my first job at MTV, yeah, the, the music television. Uh, it was amazing. I learned their community building. You know, there was no Facebook at that time. So it was all about organic community building. How do we make community on, you know, the external channels like Facebook and also internally. So I remember we did create an internal community for bikers at MTV, which was amazing. And I was a key part of that. Uh, and I think all the learnings, which I see and now look back kind of decade back is still same today, because eventually what I have learned is you need to connect technology and creativity together. If you can marry these two things, you can really go and solve a lot of problems. And then I remember this was the, again, time at MTV when we were doing surveys, 3G was about to come in. This is early last decade, right? Uh, 2009, 10. And then we were trying to do ethnographic research on will people really watch videos on phone? 
is that possible? And look where we are now. And then from there, I joined an agency. So uh, that is where I started the e-business and the traditional agency, taking them to the digital agency side of it. And uh, I was heading the accounts for PepsiCo and Unilever. So across the three brands, which is Pepsi, Mountain Dew, Tropicana, and PepsiCo, and a couple of brands in Unilever. And that was a time I started seeing that the retainer, you know, on the agency side, you have a retainer that you charge to a client. The digital retainer started growing 2x, 3x than a traditional retainer per month. And I was like, this is it. I found my niche. This is what I'm going to do. And then I was invited at cons to speak and also to attend a graduation program called the Young Media Alliance. And there I happened to encounter the Lions Health. It was a new initiative all about getting creativity and technology together on the health side of it. And that is where it deeply touched me. And that is where I realized that the meaning of digital is so different than what I have been doing my whole life. I saw how digital was able to um, to help reduce sex trafficking for girls. I saw how digital was used to help people, kids who are suffering with cancer, who are living with cancer. These are the kids who are in ICU. They don't have TV. They can't read books. They are, uh, they are still kids. And how digital is enabling them to go and connect, not just with their parents, but whenever also to increase the relationship between them and their nurses, to increase the compliance, to increase the adherence of the drug, which was eye-opening for me. And that is where I really realized that the power of what digital can do possibly in the healthcare. And then I got uh, an honor to work with Abbott on the pharma side of it. We did a lot of amazing projects. Uh, I remember we did a project time. Project time was all about increasing time spent on ethical scientific education with the customer. And project time was also about reducing the time spent, uh, which our field reps and medical reps go through every day on the clinical task. I remember we did project experience, which was about game changing and transforming all of our uh, conferences into the experiential and digital conferences. We did project trust, which is all about patient education. We did Project Ambassador, which was all about getting more people who are ambassadors of digital so we can learn from the digital natives in those wide-scale enterprise. And then I moved in uh, at Chicago. I was honored to work on this opportunity where I'm right now more on the healthcare and the health tech side of it. And I love doing design thinking, service design, accessibility, e-commerce, and I was able to build a deep expertise on how to reduce possibly the design and the dev waste across the organization. So yeah, it's an interesting journey on being a T-shaped person to kind of a pie-shaped person where I see creativity and marketing are the two key pillars of the pie and technology becomes kind of a horizontal world out there. So that is, I think, where, uh, where I think my journey has been so far. To your second question, I'll take maybe a minute more to reply on that, on what does drive me? What does drive me in this transformation is about, I have accepted and I've made peace with it, that we live in a VUCA world, you know, VUCA is volatility. Everything is iterating. Every project is iterating. Uh, and the iterating cycles are getting faster. And because of that, the volatility is increasing a lot. We live in a world which is full of a uh, lot of uncertainty. Uh, I bet everyone on this call, the projects that you're working right now, just imagine how will the project that you're working on right now will be in 2025 when 5G, quantum computing, uh, data science, which will enable natural language processing and AI will become more closer both to your customers uh, and to your internal teams as well. Uh, Complexity, you know, the easier side is I've, I've made peace with that, right? So uh, there are uh, there's a lot of device complexity, ecosystem complexity, uh, screen complexity happening, but that's on the easier side of it. But the more complexity is on the on the overall service design, on how customer journeys are being crafted, how the platform ecosystems are kind of now being crafted, how the cookies are crumbling, how the advertising landscape is changing, and also ambiguity, right? Everything is so ambiguous right now. Uh, and everything is so dependent upon the culture with that particular perspective of, of ambiguity. So because I have made peace with that, 
have accepted that as a part of responsibility. How do I possibly drive in this VUCA world? That does really drive me on the digital transformation because it is here going to stay. I, I can tell many of you on this call, trust me, possibly maybe the entire of your next lives, you will be working on digital because it is here to stay and it is here to evolve in a big time. Amazing, amazing journey. I've been from selling sims all the way to be at the center of the healthcare and caring and re reducing that uh, gap between patient and uh, I mean care, care, caregivers, and then navigating through that uh, VUCA world that we are in and that COVID seemed to have accelerated for many of us. Let's move because you were talking at some point about digital native. And I want to take on that one because of course, whenever we talk about digital native, we have a feeling that for them it is uh, uh, granted. You know, that uh, whenever we see uh, digital transformations and people feel like uh, maybe the new, the new uh, B or the new one, the corner of the road are the one that will be embracing it. And people even go to think that actually it is also for some specific functions. So let's say IT, innovations, and so on. But what I want you to help us here uh, uncover, uh, what, what, has, what experience can you share uh, when it comes to some specific uh, functions? You know, functions that are not necessarily primarily techie or maybe organizations that are not a digital native. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, fabulous, lovely question. Thank you for asking that, right? That's so important on uh, how does the support team also become a part of it or how does it happen for the team which are not digital first yet, right? So let me answer your question in two parts, right? First is, I think you touched a very important uh, word called transformation, right? And let's talk about transformation. I think, I think this is the kind of mega trend which is increasing both in the scope, in the scale, and it is, it is evolving continuously, right? It is not just transforming products and process, but the transformation is, is actually transforming the business model. I always say that digital transformation is irreversible. It's just like how a caterpillar transforms to a butterfly and cannot go back. The same way that digital transformation projects or programs bring that irreversible change. If you have if you are engaged in a project and it's been called a digital transformation project, and after that project is over, anywhere within your company, if people are going back to the previous ways of working, it is not a digital transformation project. It possibly may just be a shiny new technology or maybe just a cloud implementation, but it's not something which is truly, truly a digital transformation project. And also you have to focus on the evolution. That is something I've learned within Brightline itself, right? That transformation is important, Caterpillar transforms to a butterfly, but the caterpillar is dead within a few weeks. So you always have to be focused on what the next uh, specific perspective of the evolution is. But you know what happens is you have to understand the critical part of digital transformation is not digital, but it is about transformation. It is about being that irreversible. So now coming to a specific question on the support team. You know, earlier, and we all would agree on that, that digital was just a new channel two decades back, a decade back, it was like a complementer to your overall marketing or to your overall your commercial strategy. But now we all are in experience economy. I think we have evolved from a commodity economy to a goods economy, to a service economy, and we are entering a newly formed experience economy. And this experience economy is literally led by digital. And the same way, as many organizations, like you know how it, it became from a new channel to a digital economy, the same way <clears throat> digital was seen as a part of usually a very commercial organization. And it was fine because it is important for to generate revenue, to showcase the return on invested capital. Uh, but now digital is happening across the organization. And this is hugely affecting the support functions and other non-commercial functions. It is possibly because Digital transformations creates value and not just profit. And that's a very important thing to understand. Which teams can create value and how digital transformation can support them is, is, is not just about revenue generation, not just about profit. So where I work, right, they are hugely support organization. We have legal, QA, which is quality. You have HR, 
you have cybersecurity teams, you have training teams, you know, which help on board the uh, field reps and the medical reps across. Uh, we have supply chain, you have manufacturing, we work across the project, you have operation, finance, medical, regulatory, procurement, market access, and I can go on naming all the support function which help such large enterprises power up. And yes, it is important to focus on customer journeys. I agree, commercial is still important, but it is also important to focus on internal service designs, internal service blueprint, because they enable this journey in this possibly VUCA world. For example, let's, to, let's look at HR. HR doesn't need to just do HR operation, but HR also needs to free up its time by transforming the workforce. Right? How do we assess our performances every year? How do we focus more on onboarding? How can we automate many parts of onboarding so that we can spend more time on humanizing offboarding a bit more? A lot of organizations spend a lot of time on onboarding, but when it comes to offboarding, it becomes a bit impractical. And that is where HR I'm seeing across my peers has been transforming in possibly huge way. Uh, how are you using automation literally to enable the data-driven network, the data-driven decisions and how is that happening transform that workplace you have to understand that cloud automation data science which eventually leads to ai and machine learning this is not just happening in commercial ops right even all the uh, uh, software as a technology tool chains and the ways of working is also changing in all the support function which i possibly have shared with you a lot of HR operation needs to be automated and they have to be data driven because you need to personalize those experiences to enable this overall workplace transformation. Another thing I would say is these support organizations, Tairu, really create the moments that matter. You know, in a digital transformation, when you map the customer journeys, they are visible moments, which are usually from a commercial team perspective, and they're also invisible moments. And if you map a service design, these invisible movements are basically enabled by these support functions. And, and it's very important because they're invisible. Let me give you a metaphor, right? Don't, don't take me literally, but uh, you know, if, what if I tell you that the, that the real hormones or the emotion that is about to create all about love is not, it has nothing to do with your heart, but has everything to do with your liver. Heart is visible because we can hear it, we can touch it, we can see there's an organ working right now. And heart gets so much attention. I always say the same way commercial team gets so much attention because you can hear it, you can see it, you can see the marketing, you can feel it, you can touch it, you can get inspired by it. But the real hormones are producing in the liver, right? All the support function, which basically helps and enable all those transformation. And that is why legal, HR, finance, market access, ops, they become so, so important how they use advanced analytics, how they use data science, and how they, how they possibly help evolve from a role of just an advisor or a partner of business unit to basically an enabler, which helps the commercial teams and everyone in their decision-making process. Uh, I, I believe for, for all the commercial teams, it's no more about solving the routine operational problems or complex challenges. I believe there is a clear understanding of evolving from a delivery process to, uh, to the state-of-the-art theory. Let me give you a few examples, which will, uh, some tangible examples. I personally believe, and I have written uh, in different blogs and different places about it, um, in the future, there will be two foreign policies. One will be a foreign policy, which is, you know, we have foreign ministers, and possibly there will be a new foreign policy where you will have a foreign policy only about how your country shares data with other countries. Then imagine if this will happen, how will the role of privacy and legal teams evolve? In future, digital health interventions to, to understand the early signals, not just pills, will become the first line of defense. And if that becomes a reality, imagine how the future of uh, medical teams, which are support functions to any farm or healthcare company, how possibly will, will that enable? Smart speakers, and this is happening right now, are now ready to enable uh, and, and sense your heartbeats. I'm not sure if you know, but there's a research happening where the smart speakers in your home, like Google Nest uh, uh, and the Google speakers, they can literally uh, emit some 
very low uh, heard sound and they can actually understand your heartbeats and can actually go and record that as well. So imagine as these and these technology are enabling more and getting more in the field of uh, healthcare technology, how the role of medical officers are evolving and they're not support function, they are now coming front to it. I, I wrote an article recently that in future wearables will become just like as smart tattoos. You know, tattoos, they will become the future variables. If that happens, imagine how the role of manufacturing will evolve, right? How they're not just support function, but they are, they need to be transformed so that you can enable such business models. In yeah, future, amazing. it will not, sorry, go yeah, ahead. I was just saying, amazing. I, I was seeing you going on and there are so many things that could be covered there and quite, quite impressive. I just want to go back to the support function there as well. Yes. Uh, as you were talking about it. And of course, as you were mentioning, there are many things that will change really the way we do things. And uh, as right. you nicely mentioned as well, the support team, sometimes I would say it's a thankless job, when, or, or maybe sometimes it's not necessarily a fair one. When it is good, nobody hears it, but when it is bad, uh, people, people start screaming. Now, you mentioned automation as well. You mentioned automation, yes. and I want to follow up on it. How can the support functions and leverage the, or harness the power of transformation. Because when the, the people hear automation, they're directly be thinking about attrition and so on. So how can you get this augmented experience and at the same time uh, be able to harness that feature for the support function? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, absolutely. And thank you again for asking that. See, uh, look, and let me give you two examples, right? So for example, onboarding of an HR. Something as simple as that, right? That somebody, a hiring manager confirms that uh, we have finally found the right candidate and that candidate is about to be onboarded. Everything, right from the experience from there, you know, ordering their laptops, ordering the infrastructure, their phones, their ID card, their access badges, uh, understanding when are they about to come, are they remote, are they virtual, how the logistics will possibly have to be applied so that when the candidate comes on the day one, their experience is fantastic and ready so that you can use a lot of automation to drive things which are redundant, which are just same thing. You can do over and over. All those tasks possibly can be automated while then the HR can really invest time on humanizing the HR experiences, right? How can you enable the human touch points and movements that matter in those experiences. If I have to give you an example of finance, right? Finance is again please a support do, function. Do. So finance is not just about uh, looking at the revenues, but also is a key complementer on how can you increase the customer's willingness to pay. You know, your customers can possibly pay, uh, sorry, I'm adjusting your, uh, uh, your screen out here. So your customers, let's say, can pay out here. How can finance team enable for the customers to possibly support there? Now, for that to happen, finance team has to transform in terms of understanding blockchain, understanding the real-time ledger. It can't come from commercial team that, hey, we want to do use blockchain. It has to, it is evidently a finance operation. It has to come from the finance team. Real-time data visualization is not just commercial team or data science uh, function. It is now a finance team function so they can really enable, one of the key metrics I really focus on is ROIC, which is return on invested capital. So how possibly uh, machine learning and data science can help you build those right decisions on different parts from medical to commercial. I would also give example of robotic process automation. RPA in finance is huge. Some such simple activities as data entries can be converted to RPA so that the users can utilize their talent in more dynamic avenues, which requires more intelligence and more flexibility. And that is where finance can possibly function more. Uh, you know, I, I say that in future, a, uh, AI will be helping uh, how the bills are being passed at parliaments, right? But I, I believe data science and AI should already be helping right now to make a, a business and finance decisions. If you look at that, how companies look at uh, financial models is very different. Like uh, Amazon has a seven years understanding of an ROI, right? Uh, while few companies have a shorter cycles. If you are an organization where still you get, um, uh, where still there are funds available unused, and how can you possibly use that in a more agile fashion is important. Those era of, I need to have all my finances locked one year in advance, possibly are fading, right? Yeah, they, Things are changing so moving. fast. Exactly. And not just them, right? Um, uh, let me also give you an example of legal teams. 
So uh, there are a lot of projects that we are looking at, and across all the projects with this new regulation coming in, GDPR, privacy policy, CCPA, uh, there is a need of consent management and privacy processing. And this can't sit every time with a new project. When you're starting with a new project, you need the services coming from the support function that whatever you're doing in terms of your digital product or digital services, use this APIs for constant management, use this for privacy policy, so that they as an SME can own and govern. So commercial teams are more free to really focus on the commercial part of it and not as a product team worry about all these aspects of you know, finance, legal, quality, regulatory, because all of them has to come connected and make that uh, moment that matters possibly. Uh, yeah, so there, there are a lot of use cases I can go on, but I again say that you yeah. know, finance, yeah. HR, legal are very, very core to it. Wonderful. And I'm hearing you saying like a seamless experience here to, to kind of uh, all drive toward the moment that matters. I remember, I mean, for Uber, whenever I get off the Uber that I don't have to pay with a card and so on, just having to just go uh, without waiting is kind of uh, impressive and making the journey very pleasant. I have a question. Uh, sorry, can from, I, uh, sorry, I just double click on your Uber example, right? So I give this example a lot. Imagine the previous taxi experiences, right? In the previous taxi experiences, all the power, all the understanding was within the taxi driver, right? That person, he or she, possibly knows on which are the streets. But Uberization has changed things dramatically. It's a transformation completely, which is irreversible. The same way, uh, uh, support functions have a lot of small pockets of deep intelligence, which are powered within few humans. How can that be Uberized so that the entire organization at scale can take advantage of it? Awesome, awesome. And I'm getting one question here from Daniela. And she said, uh, basically, I work for in a company that is not uh, digital first, so what we are discussing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have some digital uh, product teams, but we feel like we are struggling to, uh, uh, to, transform, to, to our digital transformation to areas that are totally <laughs> analogical. So uh, how do you transform the areas that are not digital native. And sometimes people would say uh, the legacy that organizations have yes. tend to be what is being more like uh, slowing them down or stopping them from moving. Uh, any any insight you can share for with Daniela? That's a great question. And you're not alone, right? A lot of us go with the same problem. It's not that every part of the organization is digitally transformed, right? You know, it is happening in different pockets. and. And I, and I have an empathy and I can feel exactly what you're feeling right now. I would say practice three tips. Number one is literally do a technical debt project because legacy systems and technical debt does slow you down, right? Uh, the experience is as good as the technology lying underlying behind it. So figure out where you are from a technical debt perspective. If you want to do this, but your system doesn't support it, how will you be able to do it? If I want... If I want to make a table, which I'm sitting on, and I have all the wood up, out there, but I don't have the tool, which is the screwdriver, to really make that IKEA table, I can't do that with my hands, right? So the same way, if you have a good understanding, you need to have the technical debt project to be taken care of. Second part is always focus on how can you increase willingness, somebody's willingness to pay. So. With your digital products or, or with the services that you're possibly doing, a lot of time uh, teams go in the perspective of how can we sell more? But can you enable complements with digital? So with the same uh, number of units being sold, people are able to pay a bit more for it. Even if you get a small increase out there, that's a solid use case which will help you get more funding to invest on that. Thirdly is you need to be very ruthless on cost savings, right? So you need, you need to also increase the value uh, so you can do more is by showing the savings. For example, reducing churn can save you thousands to millions of dollars based upon your kind of business models. Even saving one person of a churn can give you a dramatic, huge advantage out there. So say where you can possibly save on those costs. Um, if you are going and talking to the C-suite or the leadership, Look at a matrix, Google that up across, called ROIC, which is return on invested capital. Uh, I can tell you the leadership loved that matrix, right? On, on what is my return on, on invested capital? 
how is that happening year on year? ROI is more about your cash flows uh, without a key time measure, but return on invested capital is something which your finance team will love and will give you those possibly budget around that. And if you're not digital first, that's absolutely okay. Again, I'm saying use technology with creativity. Anyone, anyone can learn to use technology, but it is who you are defines how you want to use the technology, right? And, and that is the key factor around it, is try to look at the culture. Uh, and why I'm saying that, you would have heard about this, that the culture eats strategy for breakfast. I can tell you, culture eats transformation for a snack. Right. So also look at the culture, because if you are doing the tech debt project, if you are going uh, focusing on the right matrix, you are able to save costs. You're able to show that you can with, with the same products which are being sold, you can charge a little bit more so you can have a funding to prove and invest on your different projects around that. But if you don't have a culture of collaboration, which is not giving out your new ideas, uh, that all again fails, right? So if you are not digital first, number one thing to be addressed is culture. And the culture can start with your team. It doesn't have to come top down. I always say it, it can also start bottom up. You can be the pivotal factor changing that because now you have an access to talk, to be a leader, to be a visible person across the company, make those changes, which 20 years back, an employee in a certain location at an office desk could not make that difference. So use that opportunity and go for it. Thank you so much, uh, Raul. Uh, I mean, I, I, I like the analogy. So transformation will be eaten as a, as a snack, right? So it's not snack. even a full meal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, going That's back to the culture point, maybe if I can add something uh, uh, for Daniela. Uh, on your culture point, you know, yes. people talk about uh, what would the transformation means for the individual as well. So what would it mean for the people that would would build, go through that transformation and how their aspirations or their desire would be connected to that transformation and what would change as a result? So uh, I, I've been listening a lot uh, recently regarding the cultural aspect and uh, people are really emphasizing the notion of trust, that people basically... Uh, whenever you are a leader or you are talking, actually what you say is what you do. So walking the talk. And I, I had a say that saying, uh, putting the signal to left and then turning right is not uh, a recipe for creating that trust within your teams. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is qu quite interesting. There is a second question because you mentioned strategy here. And um, uh, that question is coming from uh, Srinivasan. And he's saying, uh, let us help you understand how to uh, frame alerts to enable, identify the gap uh, between strategy design and strategy uh, execution. So basically what alerts, uh, warning, early signs we need to uh, help address uh, what we design. So maybe if we think about the transformation that we intended and the actual execution of that transformation. And uh, related to that is, are there any metrics that one could look to say that uh, the strategy is giving results. So the transformation that you're leading are actually get, getting some results. Absolutely. No, that's, that's, that's great. I think on the matrix, I touched on the ROIC again, because when you're doing transformation initiatives, you will be requiring a lot of capital, right? So there will be expenses, but you'll be requiring funding for a lot of capital, which have a different way how finance looks at it. So look at that as a matrix. I'll talk more on the matrix. But strategy, right? Strategy, trust me, is simple. But seeing the simplicity in strategy, that is a whole different world altogether, right? And how can you see the simplicity within that? Um, I will give you two tips. The first tip that I've learned, and uh, you should read this book called uh, Driving Digital Strategy by Sunil Gupta, and where he talks about a concept called network effect, right? Usually, if you are trying to do things um, uh, from a corporate perspective, right, which is all about driving scale, and what you are doing at one place, you can then replicate across in different places across. You need to create that network effect. What is the network effect? Network effect means whenever you do any program or initiative, whatever you're doing, as more and more people are joining that initiative, everyone sees value of it. For example, WeChat or WhatsApp, right? We all may be on WeChat and WhatsApp. Yes, they are better, more private platforms, maybe like Signal, but not all of my friends are there. So I'm still using WeChat or uh, 
or WhatsApp. Look at um, look at Peloton, right? Uh, they have Peloton Plus. So they have a service, which is a network effect that you cannot only do a treadmill or cycling, but when you're doing that, you're doing with a group of people. And as more and more content comes in, that feeds in more and more for your capital to be invested possibly around that. So the number one is understand the network effect, right? Uh, look at Amazon, does network effect beautifully. Amazon has Amazon Prime, Amazon Video, though their major uh, money comes from the AWS part of it. Uh, but they have so many complementers that they're that they're possibly building. And that comes me to the part of complementers. If you are doing a strategy from a network effect perspective, and you're able to say that if I'm doing this, and as more and more people joining, they will all see more benefit. They will be spending less while you will be getting more and more capital to invest continually on creating more complementers. Complementers are thing which again, uh, it's like a refueling your network effect. So you create a network effect, start seeing value, people start joining from different division, different support function, different teams, and then you create complementary. Uh, for example, one of the projects that, uh, that we did, uh, it was all about uh, design systems. And we create a complementers called accessibility. If you're using our design system to create products, accessibility comes as a given because everything is accessibility tested. If you're using a design system, you can then also have e-commerce in any of your product. If you're using a design system, uh, you can create your own themes. It means you can give the color and shape that possibly you want around it. If you're using the design system, you have an onboarding that is very easy so any of your any of your uh, creative agency and possibly people can look at it. So I would say just two things. Understand can you create a network effect and understand do you have enough complementers to feed into that network effect. That's the only tip I can give you which can drive that irreversible transformation because you need money. You need funding to keep fueling that transformation, right? And, and if you can crack that understanding, how you can show that so that you can constantly get that funding feed will literally enable your strategy and showing that. And if you do all of these things, you can increase your willingness to pay. So customers' willingness to pay will increase. Uh, your supplier's willingness to sell will decrease. Right, so imagine if you can sell something at this cost, and now the customers are able to pay you this much. You can go and acquire those near customers, those customers which are always sitting around, but they never, they never want to pay you because they never thought that they, you should be demanding that amount of price. But with your network effect and complementers, if they're if they're coming here, you can clearly showcase not just people are able to willing to pay more, but you can also go and acquire more customers. So once you start this network effect, it doesn't stop. It snowballs it across organization. And trust me, that will be something that you would be known for. Wonderful. I'll throw in uh, two questions here, uh, two questions in one. I mean, of course, you've been in the transformation uh, space. Where what, what initiative you've led or you were part of that has given you uh, the most satisfaction? And as you're talking about that, I want to also you to share with us what leadership trait you find has been most useful in leading a transformation. So first, your experience and the satisfaction, and second, the leadership trait that you've seen uh, uh, being useful there. Absolutely. No, thank you. Uh, I, I think there are a lot of initiatives that I've been a key part of. Uh, I, I would just I name possibly give, two. Give us a one. Yeah, just one is good. <laughs> yeah, just one. <laughs> I would I would double back on. Um, so one of the initiatives that we did in a traditional IT organization is to implement a design system across the company. Now, usually these design systems are seen in Facebooks and PayPal's of the world, right? And uh, but if you look at that, that if you can, if you really want to decrease organization-wide waste. A lot of waste on digital is getting created because of design waste and dev waste. And because of there's a lot of waste created from design and dev, uh, it snowballs other waste. For example, when new things are being siloedly designed, new things have to be siloedly developed, then new things have to be quality tested, regression tested, uh, medically looked at, and everything happens around that. If you are able to give your organization a system of Lego blocks where they can go and build the products, you have you can enable rapid prototypes. You will see just by enabling them a system and by giving a culture of rapid prototyping, you're making that a major difference. Uh, 
So that's why systems thinking is, is very near to me. And design system, one of the key projects that I've been a part of, is something which is truly wonderful. I think it has given that network effect. It has created that complements. We have a clear understanding of the next complements coming in 2022. So people see this as one initiative across the organization and how everybody is becoming a part of it. And as more and more people are getting part of it, uh, it is getting stronger and stronger and more robust. So uh, yeah, so design system, I would look at it, uh, highly recommend. I mean, it's a healthcare company. Design systems, again, is a very digital native, but why not? Digital native culture can also be involved in traditional company. And it is more, it is more crucial here because you can drive it at scale across uh, many regions and hundreds of countries. What leadership traits, I would say, one of them is really, really embrace ambiguity. I mentioned VUCA in the earliest. A is the most important part. Is you know, complexity you can solve, you can make things simple. Uncertainty, you can do a lot of research and understand trends, use a lot of data science. Volatility, you can get used to it because we are working with agile and if you change that. Ambiguity is you just don't know where it will hit you from, right? So understand to embrace ambiguity. And how you can embrace ambiguity? By upskilling yourself on design thinking and service design. Just these two things, simply these two things. If you can, if you can upskill yourself on design thinking, service design, and I'm saying these two skills are not, it's just like learning a swimming, right? So Tyro, you can teach me swimming. Uh, in, in theory, I will learn it, but the moment I take my first drive, maybe I'll drown. Right, So these skills have to be practiced across your project over and over so that you can perfect the art of it. And if you can have this mastery on these two things, service, think, service design and design thinking, it, it has, trust me, nothing to do with design. Just like how digital transformation has nothing to do with digital, <laughs> design thinking has nothing to do with design. It is all about the way that you can embrace ambiguity. Another Wonderful. leadership trait I would say is ability to say no and create a culture that people can say no. In digital transformation, there is a lot of noise, right? You should be able to clearly uh, segregate the noise from what the right thing to hear about is. And, and how you embrace that. Uh, uh, so how do you embrace that, right? You can embrace them, number one, by having a curiosity for evidence. I'm hungry for evidence. And how can you be hungry for, for, for evidence? Because you need to support experimentation. How can you support experimentation? Because you have the design thinking culture within your organization. Um, I would say last two things in terms of leadership trait. One is sense of urgency. You have to create a sense of urgency. You have to do it. It's not that, yeah, we all are in digital transformation. Uh, bring it on. We will see what happens in the next five years. No, it has to start today. You need funding for it. This is what your plan of action is. This is a team you need for it. These are the talents that you want to acquire. It, you have to create a sense of urgency. And how do you create a sense of urgency? Focus on a company's purpose. A company purpose will give you roots. It will give you stability. It is timeless. It is inclusive. But that will give you the sense of purpose. And if you have that urgency, drive that by having a simplicity. Don't confuse people. Digital transformation can be very confusing. Again, as I say, if it's not irreversible, it is not transformation. So don't confuse people that this project is also transformation. We have hundreds of projects happening digital transformation. No, then you're doing it absolutely wrong. And thank so, you so, so much. So, yeah, so no, I'm, simplicity, I'm urgency it. is very, very key. Yeah, I'm liking it and, I, and I'm not part of your team. Uh, but I could sense a, a, a strong passion in, I mean, in you talking there, and I could feel like that passion is also a stronger, a stronger engine to help uh, drive a transformation within your organization. So thank you. I, I, I feel excited actually in hearing you here. We, we have two more questions coming from the we audience. We have a lot of openings there. Uh, yeah. And, <laughs> 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 And, and, and uh, actually, I'll go over to to the, the, the last the last two questions as we nearing the end here. And that question is coming from Richard. He's saying, mm -hmm. of course, very happy to be here. And what do digital first savvy teams in healthcare deliver to patient and physician? How how can we transform from internal driver to stakeholder value in healthcare? Sorry, I was Absolutely. just uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a lovely question, right? Um, I would say something I referred to earlier as well is early digital interventions 
again, will be the first line of defense, not the pills. But how do you enable these early digital health interventions? You need to capture early signals. And if you're from a healthcare perspective, if you're able to diagnose people early, you are able to save a lot of lives and you're able to let a disorder not convert to a disease, right? If you're able to detect people earlier in diabetes, in therapies like vertigo, in therapies like mental health, uh, and, there are, and, there are, and there are various ones across, it's all about how can you get people early so that it, it further reduces down the cost of treatment because getting diagnosed early, understanding your signals, understanding your measures early, it can really reduce down the overall cost of diagnosis. It's the right thing to do. And also, customer sees value because you are moving from a treatment to also a management perspective of it. A lot of disorders I see, and this is my personal comment, right? Not coming from my company, but I believe a lot of, uh, lot of illness around, they are, they are happening because of lifestyle disorders. And usually those could be managed. If you, if you start taking pills, you'll be on pills from, for, for possibly a long time. But a lot of these could be managed. And I see a lot of companies in, in healthcare and health tech, um, including where I work from, is very focused and dependent upon getting those early signals. How can we help patient reduce that overall cost of diagnosis so that it can become affordable, accessible for all? Right, wonderful, healthcare wonderful. is something which everyone needs. It has to be made accessible. You can't make accessible by just reducing uh, things, but you can really make it accessible by doing the right thing, which is which is let them know early so they can take the corrective action very very early on. And it's easier said than done, because every therapy is so different, every research are so different. They're not uh, enough clinical trials in different places, so you need to invest in a lot of that. And that is where a lot of work is happening across the industry. And I'm so proud, so proud of where the space is possibly working on. Excellent, excellent. So as, as we close now, of course, I'll give you a big chance uh, as a last word. Uh, um, what, what advice uh, would you share with aspiring executive uh, when it comes to, I mean, the transformative world? The word questions, again, we're running out of time, so we wouldn't be able to take all of them. But we thank you for asking the questions. Uh, uh, we'll end with, with this question, like uh, in terms of what advice would you give to sitting and aspiring executive? Number one is think responsibility is freedom. It's a paradox, right? How can responsibility be freedom? But yes, it is. Let me give you an example. If you believe that you can impact climate change and is, that is your responsibility, you will do everything because now it's a responsibility. We give you freedom for everything to go and impact climate change. It will give you power to do the research, invest your time on it, maybe leave your job, only do the same thing. The same with digital transformation. If you believe that is your responsibility, you're not a SME, you're not a support, you are, it is your responsibility, whichever organization, whichever function you are on, for your team, it is responsibility of digital transformation, it will give you that freedom. So take that responsibility. A lot of time you always think, well, transformation is somebody else's job, no. Take that responsibility, start that talk, start that conversation. And second tip is, is your transformation initiative bold enough? Are you thinking incremental? Even if it's irreversible, are you thinking incremental or are you thinking 4X? So invest on what can give you that 4X returns and not just incremental. And that will help you for a long pathway so that you can think very differently. And that is again, it connects back to if you are responsible, it will give you that freedom to do that forex. Thank you so much, uh, Raul. Here and thank you all for joining us uh, across the world. Here we are again at the end of this transformation uh, talk, and I hope again as we're thinking about uh, people that are not digital native or functions that are not digital native, we just heard the case that there is room to do uh, more things there. So I would like also to thank uh, uh, my colleague Yavnika Kana, who has been uh, the curator of this transformation. Uh, talk. So, and the version here would be recorded. It is recorded, so it will be made available in our YouTube channel as well. So, if you like it, you enjoy it, please let us know, and uh, we look forward to the next one, most likely in 2022. Have a great one. Thank you, everyone.